to, for like the next two weeks. Ah, we're back. All right. So, blood, heart, blood vessels. Um, so, blood. Talk about blood. It's in your body. It's red. And uh, you have about four to five liters of blood in your body. It's all, everything's in the metric system, so you got to get used to it if you're not already. So, a liter. Next time you're in the store, go look at the one liter bottles of Pepsi or whatever they have now. They make them in two liter, they make them in one liter. Or you can pick up a water bottle. A water bottle is roughly 500 milliliters. So there's 1,000 milliliters in one liter. So don't forget that. 500 mils is half of a liter. So think about eight water bottles, ten, eight to ten water bottles, however you remember it. But have an idea of what a liter is in your in your head, because that's how it's all, you know, IV bags are given in mills. Um, it's all delivered in, in mills. <clears throat> Same thing with weight, right? Have an idea of a kilogram. A kilogram is about, 2.2 pounds or 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 you know um, a pound is it's like a 45 percent like if i want to convert from um, pounds to kilograms i just multiply it by 0.45 take however many pounds you are take 45 percent of that number and then that's that puts you in kilograms right so even though you're weighed you might be weighed in pounds they're converting it over to kilograms so everything is using Everything's using the metric system. So know, know what a liter is. And um, a milliliter, to give you an idea, a teaspoon is like, they say five milliliters is a teaspoon. So anyway, four to five liters of blood in your body. It is about 30, 38 degrees. It's a little hotter than the rest of your body. I just forgot, is your body temperature 37 or 38? Whatever. It's a little bit hotter. Obviously, I'm not going to ask you that. There, that's how I fix that. pH, um, 7 point, well, it's a range, 7.4, 7.35 to 7.4. Four five. That's the pH. So remember pH neutral seven. So you could technically say, well, seven point four is not is alkaline, right? It's a little bit alkaline. But when we talk about blood, we have to stick with these numbers very strictly. So if your blood was seven point three, I would definitely say. That's acidotic. It's it's you're in some kind of acidosis. It's acidic, and you're like, well, seven point three is not acidic because it's like above seven. So no, you can't think that way. Seven point four is blood. You can't go on either side. Otherwise, it's 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 too alkaline. It's too acidic. And your body has your your body has lots of mechanisms to keep this pH normal. Um, there's two parts that make, um, we divide blood up into two parts. There's, um, there's plasma. Plasma makes up about 55% of your blood. And we have what are called formed elements. That's the stuff that's floating in the plasma. And that's about roughly 45%. So 
So we have plasma and we have formed elements. The formed elements are your red blood cells and your white blood cells and platelets, the stuff floating in the plasma. Plasma is mostly, plasma is mostly water, about 90, 91 and a half percent water, 92 percent water, something like that. Plasma is mostly water. There are some proteins in your plasma though, so I'll write them now. There's three that I want you to know about. So there are plasma, so plasma is mostly water, but there are some proteins in it, and there's some other stuff in it too. There's some gases, there's some like carbon dioxide in it and stuff like that, but really it's mostly water and about 91.5% water, whatever, and about 7% plasma proteins. So let's talk about the three plasma proteins. The first one is going to be uh, globulins. They're used in immunity. So they'll be, they'll be called uh, aminoglobulins. The second type of plasma protein are called albumins, albumin. They do a few things, but they can move water around. Just like water follows sodium, water follows this protein albumin. So if I were to take albumin and kick it out of the capillary, the water would follow it out of the capillary. If I bring the albumin back into the capillary, the water's gonna come back into the capillary, like that. All right, so albumin's another one. And the third one is called fibrinogen. That's going to be involved in clotting, clotting, blood clotting. Fibrin. Again, here's like an OGEN, right? So if I see OGEN, I know that's inactive, and to activate it, I take off the OGEN and I'm left with the word fibrin. So already I know what it is. You know. So fibrin is something that like clots blood. So these are the these are three plasma proteins. You should know it. <coughs> I will probably ask you eventually about it. So that's the plasma. That's it. Plasma is mostly water. There are a few, some plasma proteins in it, and there are a few other electrolytes and stuff like that that are inconsequential to this lecture. Then we're now we're on our formed elements. So we are talking about red blood blood cells. Which are called erythrocytes. Erythro meaning red. Cyte means cell, of course. So erythrocytes, white blood cells, leuco. So leuco means white. Leukemia is a cancer of white blood cells. Leuco. Uh, thrombo. Thrombocytes. Thrombo means platelets clotting, something like that. You think of when I when, when you see the word thrombo in a word, deep vein thrombosis. DVT stands for deep vein thrombosis. Thrombosis. So you already know you. You see that word throm in it has something to do with like a clot or platelets or something. So that makes the formed elements. About 45% of your blood is these three things. In fact, the amount of this stuff we have in our blood when we measure it, call it hematocrit. So when we refer to somebody's hematocrit,
we're referring to the amount of formed elements. Should be around 45, right? In men, it tends to be a little bit higher. In women, it tends to be a little bit lower. So a typical lab level will be somewhere like this. And that's another thing about labs. Like people get freaked out by labs. They read their lab and like, for example, if it goes to 42, or if let's say it goes to like 48, you're like, oh shit, it's from that red. They colored it red. It's high. They put it in a separate column. But that's the only thing that's wrong with you. So what? It's like one little thing and it's one little number, right? Maybe you're dehydrated. If you're dehydrated, which one of these are you going to have less of, right? Dehydrated means water, right? You're losing water. Less blood. That means less plasma, right? Plasma is 92% blood. So that means your blood's thicker. So I expect that when I look at when you look at your blood, this number is going to go up from 45 because you have less water. So um, go drink some water, right? So, but you know, if you look at that and you see hematocrit's really off one way or the other, then you start looking at some other things. Well, let's look at this. You know, is it are one of these off? Two, two little red blood cells, maybe. So it all depends, right? So you never look at numbers, right? Numbers are never dead on, right? 92%, or I was saying 91.5. It's, like, it's not important that you know 91.5. It's important that you know it's around there. You can't say 30. Blood is 30% water. You're wrong. You're obviously wrong. But if you... You're like, should I put 91.5 or 92 or 91? Yes, right, it's just numbers. What's your hematocrit? You put 43 and you walk out of the class like, oh, I forgot, I had 45, I forgot to put, so what, 43 is right. It's not 10, that's wrong, right? So you get it, I, I don't, unless I say in class, like this number is definitely, like the pH of blood is 7.4. You can't put seven, you can't put, 6.4, it's not just one off, right? pH that 7.4 precisely, right? Other numbers, they're just numbers. Um, you gotta treat everything. I should pull up my lab. After this chapter, I'm gonna pull up one of my labs. It's got like, because one time like I told the doctor, he's like, oh, what do you want me to test? I'm like, everything. He's like, everything? I'm like, yeah. So he's like, whatever. He tested everything. Follicle stimulating hormone, progesterone, like sickle cell anemia markers, like things that I would never, that I couldn't have. Right. But we'll pull that lab up because it's got like everything on it and then we can like apply what we've, um, like some of the stuff that we've learned. It's got all the hormones on it. So anyway, formed elements, plasma formed elements. Um, we're going to take each one of these. So I'm going to talk about red blood cells, and I'm going to talk about white blood cells, and I, I might not get to all of this today. And then and then platelets. So we're done with plasma. We had the three plasma proteins finished. Now let's talk about red blood cells. I have another video that I'd already made and it uses like PowerPoint slides. If you ever wonder in class, hey, it would help a lot if I had a picture of this. Yeah, all this lecture, like the semester, has videos that I made on the side that are using the PowerPoints from the book. Right, so if you want to know what all this stuff looks like, you can look at that lecture too. Um, red blood cells. <clears throat> ah, hemoglobin.
Red blood cells are essentially masses of hemoglobin. That's what makes them red. That's what, I mean, they're, they're, the, the main function of red blood cells is to carry around oxygen, right? So um, red blood cells, interesting enough, don't have a nucleus. So, if you remember a nucleus, that's important for cell division. Without a nucleus, there's no DNA. How are you going to become from one cell to two cells? How are you going to go through mitosis? They don't do it. They don't have a... They started off with a nucleus, but as the red blood cell developed, it was called like a, it's called something called like a pro-erythroblast and then an erythroblast. At one point, the, um, the nucleus gets ejected from the cell because it's just wasting space. This thing needs to carry oxygen. The nucleus is taking up good hemoglobin space. So, <clears throat> you know, that's, how, that's what you can envision red blood cells as being just a bunch of hemoglobins stuck together. Like around 280 million hemoglobin molecules, just a mass of them, right? And of course, they. So, since they have no nucleus, they have to be made. So they're made in the um, red bone marrow. Can you find red bone marrow in like long bones, like your humerus or femur, maybe your sternum, like flat bones? I mean, who cares, right? It's the middle of your bone, right? So that's red, red bone marrow. That's where they're made. That's where your blood cells are made. And they are going to live for about four months, three months, three months, about 120 days. Wow. 120 divided by 30. Four months. Can't divide. I don't need to divide. I got my degree and I have a phone. I don't need to put anything in this head ever again. Live the rest of my life just asking my phone everything. I don't need math. So they live for about 120 days and then they're going to be taken in by your liver and your spleen. But that's coming later. So um what else no nucleus made red bone marrow whipper about however many months 120 days is four months and they die uh, you know they don't die but you know what i'm saying and then um oh there's a hormone that that we use um, it's like a common thing to use in hospitals. It's called like epigen, but um, we uh, it's it's called that's but the real name of it is called erythropoietin. Erythropoietin. You can give something to people to increase the amount of red blood cells they have. So, uh, you know, something that could happen is like maybe you're not making enough in your red bone marrow. Um, for example, you need certain vitamins to make, like for example, you know iron, right? You need iron, you've heard of that, iron is in hemoglobin, so if you don't have enough iron, you can't make enough red blood cells. If you don't have enough B12, you can't make enough blood cells. Or maybe you're making enough blood cells, but your liver is eating them up too early. They're not waiting for 120 days, and your liver is eating too many of them. Right? You wouldn't have enough red blood cells. And so you can take something like Epigen. There's some other things. Um, 
That's something that they commonly give in hospitals. Um, that's what that's what people like dope with, like Lance Armstrong. Because think about it, you, if you can get your body to make more red blood cells, then you can carry around more oxygen, which makes you better a better bicyclist. Why not? I want the whole damn SAIS team to be Alvin Kamara. Just break through like 50 people, does a backflip, and lands in the end zone. I want that. If they got to take Epigen, take Epigen. All right, so that's red blood cells. So let's talk about what happens to them when they reach the end of their life. And that's going to also kind of, when I talk about how they get broken down and recycled, that's going to show you what they're made of. All right, so. Do you have any questions so far on blood or Alvin Kamara? Because that's the team. Just make him the quarterback. Have anyone else block, and he'll just run it every time. Okay, I'm done talking about him. <clears throat> um, hemoglobin. Red blood cells are made from hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is made from two parts, heme and globin. That, that's where the word comes from. Heme is a pigment. It's an iron-carrying pigment. <coughs> I should say that. So heme is made from two things, pigment and iron. Obviously, the pigment gives your blood the red color, right? So that's the heme part of hemoglobin. Globin is just a protein. So your blood, your red blood cells, are made from three parts. Pigment, iron, and protein. The protein is globin. Right, so... Um, that's your three parts. That's what a red blood cell is, essentially. So when we break it down, when it lives to the end of its life, we have to take these three things and figure out what to do with them. Ideally, we, we, we should recycle it and use it over. Like the iron, I want to recycle the iron. Proteins always get recycled, almost always. So, you know, proteins are like cardboard. You know, it's like easy to recycle it. Proteins are always made into other things. When you eat proteins, you're recycling proteins. You're taking the sausage, all the guts shoved into an intestine that you're eating, you're taking those proteins and you're making proteins for your body. You're making hemoglobin out of the meat that you ate. You are what you eat in, in that sense. The proteins always get recycled. Your body is great at recycling proteins. So this one, what happens to the protein? It's recycled, period, done. See if we put a period there. Recycled into what? Whatever you want. Some other protein. Antibodies, hemoglobin, cell receptors, muscle, hair, whatever. It's recycled. Your body uses that. And now we're left with this. Iron, we're going to recycle it. But it takes a few steps. You can't make everything that easy. Oh, and something that I forgot to tell you. This happens in the spleen and liver. Well, it happens in the liver. But the spleen and the liver eat these red blood cells up at the end of their life. I don't know if that's the S or Z. 
So red blood cells are phagocytized. So if you remember that word phagocyte, a phagocyte is a cell that eats other things. It just engulfs it and eats it and takes it in. So we have phagocytes in your liver, phagocytes in your spleen. So your liver's here, your spleen is all the way on the left side, and um, they're like next to each other, right? So whatever the spleen phagocytizes for blood, it's gonna send all those ingredients, it's gonna send all that stuff over to the liver. So we're really talking about the liver. The liver's doing this stuff that I'm talking about here. And you can even, you can even live without a spleen. I mean, it does stuff, but the liver can take over the, the functions of the spleen. So, I put spleen and liver, we're really talking about the liver. So, when the liver phagocytizes it and breaks it up, this is what happens to the globin part of it. Now, what happens to the iron? Well, we're going to take the iron, and we're going to transport it, and we're going to hold it in a temporary holding site. It's like they don't pick up your garbage can and take that garbage straight to the dump. No, they're going to load it in the truck, they're going to hold it in a place, and then they're going to take it to the dump. I think. So, the pro there's a protein that picks the iron up and, and carries it around, and it's called transparent. Trans meaning transport. And then when you see the F-E-R-R -R in any word, that's going to tell you iron. Something to do with iron. <clears throat> so F-E-R-R -R is a clue that it's something to do with iron. And if we're talking about the body, you're probably going to guess something to do with blood. So transparent is going to transport. It's a protein that transports the iron. And it's going to take it to a temporary holding site. Can we call that te temporary holding site um, ferritin? So transferrin is going to pick it up, pick up the iron from the liver. It's going to carry it to a protein called ferritin and hold it there for a while. Because that's not the only source of iron, right? It's not like you're just recycling red blood cells forever. You're also eating iron. So um, you want to hold that iron too. So it's like a place where iron's coming in from the red blood cells, iron's coming in from food, and you get a good amount of it, then the transparent comes back and picks it up again and takes it to the red bone marrow. Oh, I get it. When I sit there, that messes you up. Yeah. All right. Let me stand in front of it. Sorry. So, to sum it up again, what happens to the iron that's in the heat? Transparent comes by and picks it up, stores it in ferritin for a while, and then once you get a good collection of iron, picks it up again and takes it to the red bone marrow so that we can make more red blood cells. Done. There's a super complicated picture in my other video or in the book. I just took the photo from the book. But that's all that this is. What's happening to the protein, what's happening to the iron, and then the difficult one, what's happening to the pigment. The pigment is not getting recycled. We're going to get rid of it. We're going to excrete it. So the pigment, this one's easy. Recycled, that's all you need. This one, transparent, picks it up, 
takes it to ferritin, then after a while it picks it up again and takes it to the red bone marrow. And we're going to reuse that iron to make more red blood cells. Pigment, we're getting rid of it. We can't use it. <clears throat> so it, the first pigment that this breaks, so this, this pigment is going to break down into a series of other pigments. And these other pigments color, give color to different things in your body. So, I'm skipping a pigment and I'm going straight to this pigment called bilirubin. There is a pigment before that called biliveridin and verde, obviously you know that word from high school Spanish. That's the only thing you remember. You remember the color for green. If you want to order a green burrito, you are set. And the library, you're good. The rest is Spanish. So, Billy Rubin is the other one. So, Billy Rubin is a very common uh, lab that people would take because you want to know, it gives you an idea of what's going on with the liver. So, um, for example, if uh, if I see too high, if bilirubin is too high, then blood cells are getting broken down too much. Right? So if you're hematocrit, so let's go back to hematocrit. Hematocrit should be around 45. So let's say it's 38. Too low. There's not enough formed elements in the blood. Why? Then I would go to bilirubin and look at that. Is this too high? That means the liver is breaking it up too much. So then you got to ask why, right? But at least you figured out the problem. So this is something common that people look at in labs. So you'll see that bilirubin, right? So this ends up in your digestive system. So this ends up in your gallbladder and is eventually going to end up in your intestine. So bilirubin is going to convert to another pigment called urobilinogen. Sorry about the words. So that's why your bile, and we, we haven't talked about bile, but you know, you have a thing called the gallbladder, and it's kind of a greenish color. And that's why greenish, yellowish, anyway, don't worry about it. It gets, in your, in your um, intestinal tract, it gets turned into a pigment called urobilinogen. And finally, some of that urobilinogen is going to get broken down and processed by your kidneys to make urine. So we call that urobilin. I have one letter to write, a U, and I couldn't write it. Urobilin is what colors your urine yellow. Then the other word is called stercrobilin. That's going to continue down the digestive tract. Stercrobilin is that brown color of your feces. So the color of your feces and urine originally comes from the color of your blood. So urobilin colors the urine, stercobilin colors uh, feces. The reason that they're colored, how they're colored, is because we're getting rid of the pigment, which is not useful. Because we have to get rid of, uh, we have to get rid of blood cells. That's kind of a pain, I know, but it's not that bad. It's just you got to learn some new words over to the left. This you got, right? You already know it. It's done. This takes a little bit of effort, but it's you can figure it out. These are new words, which kind of suck, I know. But you just got to, one of those things you got to memorize. That's why you should be studying every day 
and not cram. Let's say you're gonna put let's say you're gonna put three hours or let's say four hours into this class in total, right? So one way is that you can wait until Tuesday night and just put in four hours. They're not quality. Be much better if you put in a half hour a day and then Tuesday don't do anything. Just sit on your ass. That's much better than studying for four hours on Tuesday. You're not going to retain all that. And I can tell on your test because you know words. Like you remember this word and you memorize how to spell this word because you did it Tuesday night, but you can't put anything together. You don't understand how anything works because you study Tuesday night or, or even some of you Wednesday morning. You stayed up all night and you can tell. So half hour every day is just nice, easy. I know a half hour, you don't have a half hour. Some of you have jobs and kids and, and nobody cares that you're in school. You know, nobody's supporting you. You're, you're correct. But just study, you have to, you gotta find at least like 20 minutes, something like that, right? It'll work for you a lot better. You have to keep this in your permanent memory. Don't memorize this just for the test. Are you asking this question maybe on the final again? So you're gonna have to learn it again. Just learn it now, get it in your head forever. And in the future, when you're in whatever nursing program or something that you're in, and this, some of this stuff comes back up, you're good. You're gonna feel so much better on that day. Right now you don't feel good. You might even be pissed at me, but in the future you're gonna feel you're gonna feel much better. So do know this. This is red blood cells. This is what happens to red blood cells. Um, I do want you to know what erythropoietin is. Epigen. Epigen is just the one of the names of it. It's erythropoietin. Right, so this is red blood cells. Any questions on red blood cells? They're bi this is not something I'm going to test you on, but it's called a biconcave disc. Meaning that, well, you see the shape of a red blood cell, right? That's, that's what they got a name for it, biconcave, right? It, it, it looks like a donut, but the middle didn't get quite punched out. They, they should be nice and round like that. All right, I'm going to erase all this. Let's talk about white blood cells. If I have enough time, I'm only going to go about. I can't see. I might just go there. Uh, no, I'm going to slip it in. White, white blood cells. All right. Leukocytes. I'm smelling everything wrong. They do have a nucleus. If you don't look at the other uh, lecture, at least Google will look up, however, big white blood cells and then hit images so you can see what they look like. They do have a nucleus. The nucleus is how we can like figure out uh, what they are. I don't really care. You don't need to know what they look like anymore because it's 2020 and we don't look at these blood cells under a microscope anymore. Back in my day, we used to. We used to actually look at a drop of blood and we used to have to count how many different types of white blood cells there are. Now, every clinic has a machine. You just drop it in and it just prints it out for you, right? So no need to really know what they look like, but just, just so you can see it once, right? Just look at some image of it and see what they look like. So then you have an idea of what I'm talking about. But there's five different types of white blood cells. These are used in our immunity. And you can tell by the different types of white blood cells what might be going on. 
All right, because some white blood cells indicate certain types of infections. So let me give you the white blood cells. I don't even know if I remember them myself. But uh, the first one's called a lymphocyte. The first one I'm going to tell you. That's confusing, huh? So don't confuse the words. Leukocyte, lymphocyte. Lymphocyte is one of the five types of... <clears throat> These are like special types of um, white blood cells. When we talk about the immune system, these are going to become um, what are known as T cells and B cells. But we'll get to that later. For here, high numbers of lymphocytes it may tell me that it might be a, a viral infection. For example, if you have pneumonia, so you listen to the person's lungs, and at the top part of the lungs, you don't hear that much, and then when you hear down low in the back, when you hear down low, you hear fluid, right? So that means that there's fluid pulling at the bottom of the lungs, maybe that's pneumonia. Now, you gotta figure out what kind of pneumonia, because it, treat it different ways. Viral pneumonia, go home. But bacterial pneumonia, maybe you can do something about it. So neutrophils. You can give antibiotics for that. And infections are going to be 95% more viral or bacterial. That's what infects us, a virus or bacteria. In the United States, that's what we have. And you'll see when you Google the images of these two cells, you can see how they look different. The nucleus of a lymphocyte, it's just one nucleus and it's big. So when you look at a lymphocyte, Oddly enough, these are called white blood cells, but when you look at them in a microscope, they're not white, they're purple, purplish, right? Purple, blue, like that. So, oddly enough, they're that color, they're not white. Red blood cells are red, they're like pinkish color, right? But these are, so anyway, when you look at it, it's got like one round nucleus. When you look at neutrophils, it looks like it has like three or four nuclei in it. It doesn't, it's just one, but it looks like three or four. So anyway, just take a look at the photos, just a look at them. Um, eosinophils. These names come from dyes. When you look at things in a microscope, they're usually red or blue or anywhere in between. Red, pink, purple. So um, it's how they stain, right? And it also talks oh, for anyway. Eosinophils are high in um, parasitic infections. Like pinworms, hookworms, something like that, right? We don't get a lot of parasitic infections, but that's it. So Neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil, and then the last one I'm going to talk about is called a monocyte. Um, what am I going to say about this? Apparently, nothing important. Okay. Um, basophils. Oh. When you look, if you look in the book, or if you look somewhere, high levels of these can indicate something, and low levels of these can indicate something else. I didn't want you to know everything, right? So I just picked one thing. So a high level of lymphocytes might be a viral infection. That's not the only thing. It's just that I, I'd rather you learn and keep in your head one thing, right? It's, but there's other things you're gonna read, and don't get confused, I mean, these are like the main things, though, right? So, um, 
basophils, um, allergies. Monocytes, um, fungal infections, and or tuberculosis, which is oddly enough a um, oddly enough it's a uh, bacteria. Hey Siri, what do monocytes do? See, this is the problem with the worldwide internet. They're not giving me the answer that I want. Anyway, check out all me for these last two. Sometimes I get them reversed. I think I'm right. But, you know, sometimes I'm not. Um, so just check up with me on this. Oh, you know what I could do? Hey, Siri. Basophil allergy. Yeah, I think I'm right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sticking with this. I know I asked Siri in the middle of class. Um, but you'll have it. You'll definitely know this. Okay, so I'm going to end it here. Let's talk about your exam. Um, just like, let's spend five minutes talking about it. So let me erase this. I'm going to ask about 10 questions. You, you know how they are now. So um, one thing that I could ask about, um, Taking the um, the red man to your tension thing. The whole process, the whole thing I wrote on the board. Angiotensin one getting converted to angiotensin two by angiotensin converting enzyme. It's long. I hope you spent some time on it already, so you don't have to deal with it. You know what is angiotensin two? It's a, it's a basal constrictor. What does aldosterone do? You know, how does that affect blood pressure? That whole thing. High, very high chance I'm going to ask that. Really high chance. I'm going to ask it. So know it. What do, the, what do steroids do? I had six functions down. It, you don't have to put what I put exactly, but you have to have an idea of what steroids do. If you put five and not six, if you happen to miss one, but you kind of have an idea of what steroids do, that's fine. <clears throat> Just have an idea of what steroids do. Then the um, What are the hormones of the pancreas? There were four, right? So that's from today. This is all from today. Well, no, not this. But this is from today. This is from today. What are the what are the hormones of the pancreas? You know, um, and uh, what do they do? So what does insulin do? What does glucagon do? Somatostatin, pancreatic polypeptide. What do they do? Um. How are thyroid hormones made? T3 and T4. There's two ways you could be doing this stuff. For example, you could memorize every step from your book. And there's like eight steps or whatever. That's the worst way to learn it, unless you're really good with books. You could learn it that way. Or you could just try to, you know, act. if you were to explain it, if you were to learn it good enough that you could explain it to somebody, how would you do that? So let's say you have to explain it to a friend. 
how are they made? And you just want to make it simple, right? That's that means way more to me than you know learning the word thyroglobulin. You could just put TGB for that, right? So if you're getting hung up on that, oh, should I learn thyroglobulin? Oh, I'm going to put TGB. He's going to mark off points. I'm not going to mark points off for that if you know what's going on, right? So you can explain what it is. It's essentially iodine and 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 the protein and the follicular cells are taking them and, and, and mixing them all up. You know, they're pulling iodine from the blood. They're taking the charge off of it. I don't care if you know deionization or not. They're taking the charge off. You know what's happening, right? You can explain it to somebody and just write your answer like that. Write it like you were explaining it to a friend. You know what you're talking about? I'm not going to be hard on you. I just want you to understand it. If you're missing words or little details, and I know you understand, then you're good. I'll be gentle. If I see that you just try to memorize words, and you're writing arrows like I write in class, no. Then I'm going to nitpick. So anyway, this, how, how the thyroid hormones are made. Um, I'm debating whether I should add blood in here or not. I'm going to. Well, the stuff from today, I was thinking. Okay, you know what? Let's go back to some. Let me, let me. Now I'm ready. That just means less for the future. What happens to the red blood cells? Remember what happens to the globin, and what happens to the iron, and what happens to the pigment. So new words to learn, but... Um, I'm going to I'm going to use a question from the quiz. The uh, pituitary hormones. Same, same question. I might not say what are the releasing hormones. I might say instead, um, you know, what are the cells that make them, or, or what are the targets? You should know where ACTH is going. Where is TSH going? Um, the two posterior hormones. Again, this is stuff that you studied for the quiz one. So you should know what oxytocin does, and you should know what vasopressin or ADH does. Three more. Um, I don't know. Um, My pen's losing. I hope you can see all the way up there. I wrote hormone interactions. That's from your previous quiz. I'm not going to put the mode of action, even though I should, because a lot of you got the water soluble wrong. But I know that's like another huge one, so I'm not going to put it. Um, Nine, um, function of, I guess, human growth hormone, why not? How is it like, um, uh, epinephrine? How is it like epinephrine? How is it different? Well, how it's different is it? How is it alike? You should definitely know that by now. Lipolysis, 
uh, glycogen breakdown or glucose formation, however you want to say that. That's how they're alike, right? But human growth hormone is for growing. Epinephrine is for like fight or flight, right? They're different. They've got different ideas. Or I can even ask you thyroid hormones. How's T3 and T4 like this? Same answer. Lipolysis, glucose formation, but not the protein. Here are your... You're, 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 you're using proteins to grow. Um, I don't know, I guess I want to do a 10. I don't want to keep thinking of stuff. Nine, that's a lot. But, yes, it's a lot. But you know what I'm asking. I'm giving you the test. I'm not really giving you anything, huh? Because you still have a lot to study and learn. But you know what I'm going to do. At least you know that. The question is, do you want to put in the time? So, the answer to that is yes. Today. Today. Put the time in today. So, don't cram. You shouldn't be cramming on this stuff. You have to change your mindset if you are cramming. So, um, yeah. Any questions? Oh, we went a long, we went a little bit longer than I wanted to, because I know you guys have like a, you know, you, I start losing people after an hour. So, that's it. If you have no questions, I'm going to stop recording this so I can post it. If you guys have any questions, you can hang out and, and just unmute yourself.